Aaron Flynn, thank you for Skyping in. We appreciate it, man. Oh, thanks, Ben. This is really cool to be on this. This is I like doing stuff like this. It's good. So getting right to it, uh, what's it like to be general manager of Bioware these days? How's it going for you? Oh, it's a it's a pretty enjoyable job. I, I feel very privileged to get to, to to be in my role here. Um, I've been at Bioware almost 17 years now, so I've seen a lot of stuff uh, at the studio, uh, at all of our studios, really. But, you know, it's funny. Every time we get to this point where we're ready to launch a game, especially one as big as Andromeda, it feels like this is the best time to be in my job because I get to uh, talk about something that, that is very exciting to us. Uh, things around Andromeda are interesting because we've said so little about the game to this point, right? Unlike um, more typical press cycles, uh, we've held a lot more back given how relatively close we are to launch. And so we've done some trailers at, at uh, places and stuff, and we've given some views at places like the Sony uh, PlayStation 4 Pro event, but uh, much still remains unknown about it. And so I think it's nice to finally be able to talk about it and get into some of the details, especially share some of the gameplay that fans are so interested in. Yeah. Uh, and so that feels like that's the best part of my job. It's sometimes uh, harder for me, and I'm sure I know the developers feel the same way. Uh, when you want to talk about something you're excited about, and you know, we just have to keep it quiet until we can, till the right time. What is that change in strategy? Why are you, were you so quiet this time around? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's something you're seeing in the industry more. I think that there is, uh, especially with uh, established games like uh, established um, things like Mass Effect and. Uh, you saw this other other companies, brands like Fallout uh, do this. Yeah, I think the challenge that, that uh, um, it creates for Andromeda, though, is, is while we, we try to adhere to this strategy, while we try to we think it's going to be good, we always end up disappointing people and fans because Andromeda is the kind of game where it has you know many elements in a setting that's Mass Effect, but at the same time, there's so much new about the game and so much happening that people want to know about. Um, and so we really appreciate that our fans have stuck with us and, and been patient while we put all this together, ready together. The other practical reality that it benefits from doing this is, is we feel much more confident about what we're going to deliver to players by talking about it later as opposed to earlier, right? When we talk about things early, sometimes things that are important to fans like uh, who the followers are going to be and what they said, sometimes those things adjust, shift and adjust or maybe when we cut a follower because we can't, we can't get it done to quality. Uh, and so we always feel like, oh, did we, we feel bad now because we mentioned that kind of thing. This is the kind of where we're at in the industry right now is one where uh, we just want to have a, a lot of confidence when we talk about these things to fans. We don't want to make any false promises to fans. We don't want them uh you know thinking they're going to get something in the game that ultimately we can't deliver because yeah. of uh, practical realities sure. uh so by doing this and 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 having our fans be patient with us we get to go out with you know 99 percent confidence on this stuff which is great has it been a more nebulous development cycle than previous mass effects or previous bioware games do you think? oh yeah yeah the, the development cycle on this one very much maps to uh, uh mass effect one um again when we did mass effect one back in 2005 2006 you know, a decade ago now, a lot of the stuff we had there, new engine technology, where we were one of the first outside developers to use UE3 at that time. Um, uh, we were we were reshaping the entire IP, right? We had this this idea of building a kind of a space opera RPG, uh, but uh, other than a few of those words and some ideas in people's heads, there's just an enormous amount of work to translate that into into actual uh, gameplay and, and an experience. Mass Effect Andromeda, obviously, we have more confidence in what we're building at that point. However, we switched to Frostbite. This is our first uh, Mass Effect game on Frostbite. We did want to spend uh, a fair bit of time uh, lifting over every rock and going back to the original vision documents for Mass Effect and saying, what did we really want to achieve with this with this this original game or even the trilogy that we didn't because of, again, time constraints or budget constraints or just... You just the technology. We can't do it on this on this um, on this generation of hardware. So we spent a fair bit of time of that, and so that did create ambiguity for sure. Um, you know, we we incubated a new uh, leadership team to do this one. Uh, the the original Mass Effect leads, many of the original Mass Effect leads, um, ended up going on to start our new IP, which is in development, and so. We wanted to support them in doing that, so we had to grow up a new a new set of leads. Uh, luckily for us, many of them were people who'd been senior developers on uh, the original trilogy who now just had to take on more responsibility and step up to the plate to do that. And uh, by the by, they've done all that, which is great. Yeah, I'm really curious about like the development history of this game because uh, Casey Hudson, when he finished 3 as creative director, did he move on to this or was he immediately on to new IP? How much of this vision is Max, the new creative directors, versus Casey's? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, just to think back, uh, the setting and everything was done when Casey was still with us. That was all, uh, locked at that point. Um, I would say Mac and the production team and the leadership team on Andromeda get full credit for, 
uh, realizing what we were what was originally set up as a vision statement that we're going to take um, uh, we're going to take uh, a bunch of people to a new galaxy. We're going to go to Andromeda, and you're going to tell a story in Andromeda. And then from there, those guys uh, took. Yep, that's our plan. Let's do that. And then some of the tenants, like we want to do more open world things with the game. You know, give people uh, planets to explore as opposed to straight up linear missions. Obviously, the the challenge that creates is we can't lose what people love about Mass Effect. Uh, we're very proud of our some of the stories we've told through those very linear missions. So we want to keep those um, doing things like going back to the uh, Mass Effect 2 and saying we want to tell loyalty stories again, give people a chance to get really intimate with these characters and, and decide ultimately whether to earn their loyalty or not was uh, was another thing that, that um, was in the original design but then had to had to be implemented, had to be um, done properly by, uh, by the production team and by uh, the leads team. Yeah. Was it always Montreal? Were you always incubating that talent in Montreal, knowing that Mass Effect eventually is going to yeah. shift over there? Yeah, um, we've been we've had Montreal in the studio family for uh, six and a half years. I want to say now six, maybe it's coming up to seven. But uh, the the idea, even while Mass Effect three was still in development, was the uh, the leadership team on the trilogy would would move on by choice. You know, they they had done this game for almost ten years at that point, so they decided that they wanted something different. Um, and Max, a fellow who um, had spent some time on the new IP, uh, but then decided, no, my actual, uh, you know, there's there's still more I want to do with Mass Effect, and and uh, given the opportunity to be creative director, he did that. Um, and then other folks like uh, Mike Gamble, uh, he was a producer on ME2 and ME3, he's still uh, a producer on Andromeda, um, and then you see a ton of new folks um, like that, and Yannick, our studio director in Montreal, he was on the original Mass Effect uh, 1 game as our development director. So it, it's really a mix of talent and things like that, and, you know, it's funny, I think we've said this before, but, you know, one of the observations uh, Mac and I were making with a few others while we were chatting about this one night is the funny thing about Andromeda for us, as some of the people who've been at Bioware for a long time, that, that took a little while to get our heads around was people would, new people to the team, would, would talk about the game and say, well, I want to do this, I want to accomplish this, I want to do this, and we'd be like, wow, that's that's really interesting, great, okay. And, and we heard it enough that we started to go, where's this coming from, like this... It's, it's a beautiful energy people are bringing to this project. There's a lot of really interesting things. And it turned out when we actually started to, to talk about it more, it was coming from a place of, of these, these developers were first fans of Mass Effect back in the day, and then they became game developers. And, and Bioware, in many ways, is a, with its, the way we build our games, it's a relatively young uh, young studio, you know, our our oldest IP that's in development is from 2009, right? Dragon Age, right? Or sorry, two that is is Mass Effect 2007, and then Dragon Age 2009. So these things aren't even 10 years old yet, and yet we're finally seeing for the first time people joining the teams to be to work on these games and work in this in this uh, in this fiction, who started off as gamers and players first. And then became and then became game developers who wanted to go and, and build the game that they loved a decade ago. And and when we made that realization, we were like, okay. So we sat down with some of them, we talked to them, and and what Mass Effect meant to them in their heads was so amazingly different than what it meant to us. Because sometimes we get bogged down in 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 the realities of making computer games, right? You know how this is a job and how this is. And it was, it was super refreshing to talk to these, talk to these younger developers. In some cases they weren't even younger. You know, there are people who maybe made a career change or, or do something that came in, but um, people who said, well, I'm on this project because I, I adore mass effect. And it's the first time in, in my career that I've actually seen that phenomenon happening. We don't, you know, cause again, mass effect only came out in 2007, mm -hmm. but now that's approaching 10 years old. So you can imagine some 16, 17 year old playing that game and going, wow, and then I'm, I should go make computer games for a living. I love this. They have time to go do that. They start their first jobs where then they join Bioware, and lo, lo and behold, they're making Andromeda, and now they're contributing, and they're wanting to take it in all these different amazing directions. You're going, well, okay, great, but you know, let's look at our let's look at our schedule here. Let's look at this, <laughs> and and they're going, but but but, and then you realize, oh, you're doing this because because you you have this incredible ideal for what Mass Effect could be for a new generation of fans. Yeah. And when Mac and I were, and others were talking about it, we were like, holy sh**, that's mind-blowing. That was incredibly rewarding when we realized that. And I think yeah. the the opportunity for fans, new fans, old fans and new fans alike, is going to be they're going to get to see a, a, and play a Mass Effect game, which really is the synthesis of a lot of really traditional uh, RPG ideas 
and then I think some much newer ones that have come into the industry um, far more recently. When you have a universe that's so strong and as well defined as Mass Effect, how much do you feel like that lore kind of does the heavy lifting of carrying the franchise forward versus specific creative leadership? Oh, uh, good question. I think it depends on the creative leadership because I think there are creative leaders who love to work uh, within an existing universe and love to 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 feel around and, and, and work within that. And there are those who want to push boundaries and go out. Um, again, Andromeda is a bit of a, a bit of a hybrid case because it is both. There are design elements that are going to be in Andromeda, which are brand new to Mass Effect as a as a as a game. There are lore elements too, which are new. You know, new alien races, those kind of things. If you go from Mass Effect one, two, and three, the the box was tighter around those three. You know, having a continual story, um, the story of a hero who becomes a legend, Commander Shepard. That's, I think, more constraining and, and working within those creative constraints, again, presents its own opportunities and challenges. Uh, but this one is is um, uh, is more open uh, than that. It's easier. One thing I've observed is it's easier to make mistakes within uh, when there's fewer constraints, obviously. Right. You know, you can you can um, could find yourself uh, very much bogged down in details that aren't relevant or you, you find yourself going down a path and, oh, no, that's the wrong path. Backtrack, backtrack. Um, but. That said, you probably have to do that with a franchise with like Mass Effect every now and then. If you don't do that, you know, you're, you're going to find you're telling the same story over and over again. And you don't want to do that. You don't want you want players to to I think a good franchise should be growing and evolving along with with what is happening in the industry and what's happening with with the fans. Yeah. So uh, hopefully people find that about Andromeda. Yeah. When we visited the studio, one of the striking things was you know the amount of planets you can visit, how big those spaces are, how many quests are trying to pack in. And it just became an overwhelming amount of work to imagine what it's like to piece all that together. So I'm wondering, like, oh, yeah. the cost of production this generation, has it been shocking to you? Mass Effect Andromeda's budget versus Mass Effect 1's? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just an industry norm, right? These these big console games, their budgets are increasing. And it's it's um, players are insatiable and bless them for that. They, you know, they, they love content. And when they love the lore and love the setting and love the, the fiction that they're going into, their their appetites are boundless. They 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 can keep playing these things and keep experiencing them and keep going. So you know, as, as much as it becomes uh, difficult to manage these things, and you know, I feel like I'm aging at twice the rate uh, I would if I was in a simple desk job. But so be it. That's my choice. Um, uh, I think that I think that it's a it's a joy to be able to do that for players and to give them those things and to and to say, okay, you want more. Let's give you more. Let's let's push ourselves creatively and 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 within the disciplines to deliver that. And then you got to make choice to do that. Could we have done that on on traditional technologies? Maybe not. So putting it on Frostbite lets us use all of the um, uh, insiders that we have here at EA, all the experts within EA who can travel to Montreal, travel to Edmonton, you know, show us how to do certain things and push the technology. And that's a that's a great thing to do. And yeah. so you have to make sure that those conditions are set there for the team to then go and succeed to that creative vision that, you know, and then the budgets go up and everything else happens as a consequence of wanting to present something that is stronger and, and more engaging and better than our past work. Yeah. I mean, you talk about fans' appetites being boundless. Budgets aren't boundless. So do you feel a lot of pressure? Not, to like, no, do you feel a lot no. of pressure to expand the tent then for what a Mass Effect audience can be? Um, yeah, you know, I think, I, I think I, you never want to say who you're, you got to have an idea of what your player wants. Obviously it's not about that, but, but one of the things I never want to do is say, this game isn't for you. This, you, you won't enjoy this game. That's not my decision to make. That's players should, should get to experience these things and dip their toes in these, in these games. And if they like them, great. And, and sweet. um, some of the best stories over here for fans are from those who, traditionally don't like sci-fi or traditionally don't like role-playing games and all of a sudden their friend passes them the disc and they are okay i'll try this and you know they find some way to fall into the fiction and then they're pleasantly surprised and they and they fall in love with what they played you don't want to be limiting that way and you don't want to you don't want to think about that um that said you know uh, the good news for us is that is that we're still here despite spending all this money on these games and so that's good um uh we do try to be prudent about these things uh you have to you have to make sure that the studio is going to be here next year to build more content and stuff. So you can't you can't bet the farm on any one game. Um, but you know, then again, maybe you do, right? Maybe sometimes that you'll you'll get so excited about something you'll do that. Uh, Mass Effect drama is pretty close. Like you know, I know the 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 
the the men and women in in Montreal really feel like this is their game and and they're really pushing hard to make it the best game they can be and so I know they feel very passionate about about giving everything they've got into that game and the folks helping in Edmonton and the folks helping in Austin feel the same way now now that we're on the road to closing it down and delivering the experience so much of it is playable and so much of it is is you can experience it's tremendously exciting there's so many things in the game which are better than we've ever done anything at Bioware before yeah I mean going back to the beginning of the conversation you're talking about how you guys relatively quiet uh during this period of development I feel like fans have seen headlines of like oh development director left writer left what's going on here and now we're hearing that you know Austin and Edmonton are helping out more and more with Montreal was that always the plan or has there been kind of a shift to bring in more talent from the other studios to kind of corral this thing um, yeah, uh, more the latter. Um, you know, we're lucky that when we're all in the same company, we have some operational flexibility to go and, and, and have people help out. Um, that wasn't the original plan. Um, when you look at the challenge of trying to hire people, trying to get people into studios, um, it's sometimes easier to say, okay, well, we have this group of people here who are talented and who want to learn Frostbite and do these things. They are in Austin, let's put them on there. Or we have Edmonton developers who uh, have a ton of expertise on Mass Effect. It can go in and, and solve some of the challenges that, um, uh, you know, just makes more sense to have them help solve than to, than to hire people and, and do all that kind of thing. So, yeah, so no, not the original plan, but a credit to the team. They make it work, and I think they make it work because at the end of the day, everybody loves Mass Effect, and everybody thinks that, you know, this is going to be a great game. So they, they roll their sleeves up, and they get in there, and they go do it. Yeah, and it's good that we're all again good that we're all part of Bioware in multiple locations, and good that it's um, uh, good that we have uh, all the infrastructure within EA to make that happen. That's a that's a that's a good place to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, how's the new IP going over there? Well, it's good. Um, you know, again, a little bit like like Mass Effect. It's far. It, it's we're not going to talk about it until it's very much. You know, we're very confident about what it's going to be and everything. But um, yeah, we've been doing reviews with uh, our CEO uh, Andrew Wilson, and uh, I think he likes it. So, knock on wood, we'll keep working on it and we'll keep doing it. Um, but I, I hopefully you'll hear more about that once Andromeda's done, and uh, we, we've 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 satisfied fans uh, for that with that game. What uh, what has been Wilson's take on it so far? Does he have a takeaway message of like, holy cow, this is more blank than I expected? Um, yeah, what would he say? What would he say? This is more done than I expected, I think, ah. is, is hopefully what he would say. The new IP is interesting. There'll be there'll be a whole other video chat on that one day for sure. We'll, yeah. we'll, lots about that. Uh but yeah, I think it's I think it's you know, you asked me earlier what it's like to be uh in charge of, of Bioware. Well, you know, I'm lucky to be part of a of a set of teams who do their jobs extremely well and who care very much about ensuring fans are happy. And every one of our games, franchises, Dragon Age, Mass Effect, the new IP, and then what we're doing down in Austin with SWOTOR, very much born of that desire to take what we take the universe that we get to play in there and then give fans something that they can be excited about and, and have a lot of fun with. Yeah. Uh, just in general, how hard is it to create a new IP? Uh, this generation in the year 2016 or whenever you guys debut it, do you feel like it's a, it's a real challenge in the industry? Um, yeah, yes and no. It's a privilege to get to work on new IP. It's it's one of those once every 10 years kind of a things you get to do, at least in our side of the industry. You know, I think credit goes to the indie developers who take so much of that burden on themselves when they go and, 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 and start up something independent. Uh, I mean, it's enormous, it's enormous amount of, of resolve and, and responsibility it takes to do that um, and to know that it's all on you to do that. Luckily, we have uh, teams here who help out and hold hands do that kind of thing that said uh having a larger team working on new ip presents its own challenges um you know it's a lot of soul searching i think similar to indie developers it's a lot of soul searching you you have to ask yourself do you want to do something uh fiercely different or do you want to do something uh that's that's um very recognizable and and do you want to take something that you've done and just put a spin on it or do you want to wipe the slate clean and say, what would we do in this? And, you know, for us, you know, what we said was we're Bioware. So we have a certain, you know, a certain kind of, um, a game that we love making and, and we know our fans would love. So we started with that and that's a game that has at its heart stories and has its heart, um, uh, storytelling. 
And so we decided that we're going to stick with that. We're not just going to walk away from that when we started new IP. And I think once we once we agreed on that, uh, then everything else started to fall into place. And you said, well, what would we want to try? We'd want to, well, we want to push technology. So what's a what's a good way to do that? Well, this would push that. Okay, let's do that. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I remember in 2014 uh, at E3, there was a teaser cryptically talking about the new IP, and it, the messaging was uh, modern stories and dynamic worlds. Is that still the case? Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, stories. You know, again, I think our best stories are ones that are uh, relatable to people. Um, you know, and and you know, James Olin, our our, uh, our director of design down in Austin, he always says he taught me a good lesson a long time ago. He says, "Great stories come from great characters," and so. Now, we still want to populate this game with amazing characters and, again, keep challenging ourselves to make characters that are relatable, characters that are uh, ones you'd want to get to know in, in, in real life if they if they existed that way. And then, you know, push them to be more and more real, more and more um, uh, believable and understandable so that you just you keep getting sucked into that fiction. We're in an amazing place in history right now. I, I don't think – I think – it's no wonder the games industry is the biggest part of the entertainment industry right now because we can just do things that movies and film and books just just can't do. So going down to Austin a little bit, uh, you guys have an amazing opportunity to work with Star Wars. Is, mm-hmm. there, is there momentum to keep Old Republic going? Do you want to start something new within the Star Wars IP at some point since EA has the license? Yeah, you know, I think there's both. Um, you know, we're very lucky to have hundreds of thousands of players uh, who love SWOTOR and who are excited now for our new expansion pack uh, coming out in uh, late November, early December. By the same token, you know, that um, if you know anything about the Star Wars universe, um, then you know that the older public setting is 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 way back here. And so much of what um, the Lucas story team and everybody's working on is way up, you know, thousands, thousands of years in the future. Uh, whether it's Rogue One, which is going in and telling uh, what is known to be a story, but has been secret for a very long time, and, and doing something beautiful with that, or then um, you know doing things with other elements of that story, those are super compelling, and I think fans are going to adore those when they come out. And so there's always that itch with people who are as intimate with Star Wars as a lot of our developers are, especially down in Austin, and who then get a bit of a window into that and say, "Oh, we could do something there. That'd be pretty incredible. Could we tell that story?" And we're we're very lucky to have Lucas as a partner who. Uh, respects us, you know, as much as we respect them, and give us give us insights and chances, and say, would you want to go there? Would you could you do that? What about this? And so yeah. it's uh, it's it's cool to to be a bit of an insider there and to think about what we could do, you know, interactively, right? It's we don't want to just tell a story. We don't want to take a take a movie and then create a create a a game out of that necessarily. We want to give players agency and choice and, and, and consequence and those things. That's where interactive entertainment really shines. Yeah. And so if we can do that, then if we can find that opportunity to do that, then I think we'd be we'd be asking EA to for the for everything we need to go do that. And do you feel like you guys have built up so many MMO experts down there, you want to keep that rolling? Or do you feel like there's enough lessons within the MMO genre where it can apply to just about anything? I think both. Um, you know, lessons are great because you know, lessons don't have to, lessons can transfer, right? Lessons can be taught. They don't have to, they don't involve necessarily stopping doing something to go over here. They can be, they can be um, uh, shared and, and taught. So uh, I think we have learned a lot of lessons on, on the older public, uh, you know, more than I could possibly recount in a 30 minute video interview. But by the same token, um, the industry moves on and, and you, you want to take those lessons and apply them in, in really new and interesting in ways. Uh, you know, even just what they learned as to how to run the kind of heavyweight server architecture down there, which is you're just seeing more and more in games. That's, that's incredibly important for us to retain and hold on to. And, and, you know, so our players get good experiences when they have to go online. So talking about lessons, uh, I'm wondering what, were the takeaway lessons from Shadow Realms, which was the new IP you announced from Austin, uh, ultimately was canceled, put on hiatus, I don't know the exact terminology, but what was the takeaway from there? What did you learn as general manager on that project? Uh, so I was on that project, actually. Um, that actually was uh, the Austin uh, guys themselves. Uh, another fellow who's now at Zynga was in charge of that one. Um, and uh, so I, the lesson I took away from it as, as uh, the guy running uh, Bioware Canada at the time uh, was simply uh, don't announce things too early. Um, uh, they didn't have much to talk about at the time. Uh, 
they wanted to go and and show people that they could they they were working on something. They were excited about it. They were they were ambitious, and um, uh, it hadn't passed all of the necessary uh, tests within the studio to to really get everybody to understand it's viable. Like you know, when would it come out, et cetera? And I think they just unfortunately spoke about it too early, and so hence the lesson of with a little bit of our of our new IP here in Canada, uh, and then the um, uh, Mass Effect talking late just. Let's just make sure we're, we really understand what we're building here, what we can commit to. How much of your time is spent having discussions about preserving the Bioware name, about making sure that that's always a real mark of quality and making sure it's pristine within the EA larger family? Um, you know, not a lot, um, to be honest. Uh, and I don't mean that to sound like because I don't care about that. It's, it's <laughs> far from it. It's probably my number one uh, anxiety. Honestly, because I think everybody gets that. Uh, I think every every studio within EA... You know, as I talk to the to the folks who manage those studios, um, they all have their own uh, uh, cultures, their own um, things that they want to make sure the industry always believes about what they're there to do. Um, you know, quality is top of mind for everybody right now. We're very privileged to be where we're at in, in the industry because we, we we do see more things and we do have access to more information um, and uh, than our fans do. And uh, that's that's a burden. That that in of itself is the burden because we have to deliver for our fans really amazing stuff, stuff that's new, stuff that's innovative, stuff that makes them go, "You could do that! I didn't know you could do that! Wow!" Uh, because that's our responsibility as as developers. I know whether it's Andrew Wilson or Patrick Soderlund, they expect that of me, and they expect that of of the folks at Dice, and they expect of the folks at Visceral, like Amy and and Jade Raymond, and they expect it of all of expect it of all of us. So yeah. that's the thing, and then. One of the tools I like to, you know, I like to, um, I, we use in, in delivering that is, well, what's the what's the bio heritage? What have we, what are we, what do we know our fans love, and what do we love doing? And since we love telling stories, and we love doing it with um, uh, in these amazing universes, then that's what we'll keep doing. You know, one of the one of the things that's really exciting about Andromeda is one of the things we said was, well we've never been really happy with the way we create our characters from a, from a visual perspective. Um, we've always employed, we've never employed the cutting edge techniques that you see in some of the other games, like performance capture and those things. Uh, we've always done a lot of that by hand and through um, procedural things. And so we took it on ourselves with Andromeda to say, well, let's actually try to adopt those technologies. Let's, let's, let's take what we know and love about Byra, which is quality characters and let's raise the bar and go after them in a way that's that's um, better than done it before. And and so I think we we've accomplished that. You can knock on wood. Uh, but um, that's more the kind of conversation we have about what's the legacy of Bioware and how do we do that as opposed to you know having to tell people, hey 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 hey, you know we make quality here. Mm -hmm. So so hands off. Uh, no, people are far more um, understanding and far more um, able to to get the details and nuances of that around this company than, um, than something more black and white like that. Yeah, for sure. So with Dragon Age Inquisition uh, and now Mass Effect Andromeda, even though, you know, different different themes, sci-fi versus fantasy, you can see there's a lot of overlap there in structure where it's kind of open worlds-ish. Um, yeah. Not sure what the new IP is like, but do you feel pressure to reinvent things this generation? Do you feel like the future of Mass Effect can shake things up in a, for example, in a way that's been very successful for companies like, uh, you know, Activision with Destiny or Ubisoft with Division, do you feel like a co-op campaign future could work for Mass Effect? Oh uh, yeah, I, I do. Um, uh, we love co-op campaign, and um, uh, there is a kind of a story I think lends itself beautifully to co-op campaigns. We did this with Swotor, right? There are elements of the story you could play with your friends and stuff, and and there were successes and, and failures within that in that execution. But yes, I think uh, co-op campaign is an extremely exciting opportunity for storytelling, especially. And it's one we, we think a lot about here. It's a really tough nut to crack. I don't know. It is absolutely. And I wouldn't say anybody's uh, cracked it perfectly and, and maybe there's no perfect way to crack it. Right. You know, even if you look at more traditional single player um, storytelling, there are many, many implementations of that, right? You've got a very highly cinematic implementation like, like we do here. Um, you know, my my younger son uh, loves Undertale, and and I played Undertale with him, and what a great story Undertale tells, right? And and that's with you know eight bit graphics and all these things. So so there's still there is no 
there is no singular execution of a story in this industry. There's only what you desire to do, how you choose to express it, um, what's maybe right for the kind of story you can tell. You know, Undertale has this beautifully quirky story with you know this with these characters that fits that fits that telling fantastically right it's it's remarkable and my son comes to me all the time oh, you gotta watch this it's so great it is it's good you watch it like oh yeah that's very clever you know some really really smart moments in there right is it too late to make the new IP just an Undertale licensed game? Is that still on the table? It, it come, it came up. Yes, I, <laughs> I, uh, it, it did come across my desk as doing it that way, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not, but uh, it, it could have been for sure. <laughs> well, hey, I'm really excited for the future uh, of Vior Games and specifically Mass Effect Andromeda. You guys are still hitting springish for 2017. Spring, That's the plan. Yes. Spring, yes, yes. Come hell or high water, you're hitting spring. I wouldn't say come hell or high water. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say come hell or high water. I would love to. I would love to ship it in springtime. Yes, I would okay. love to ship it in springtime. Um, uh, but I, I won't. You know, I want to support this team in building the game that they want to build. And if they come back and say this is what we got to do, then my charge is to help them get there with that. Awesome. Well, hey, Aaron Flynn, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, man. Thank you, Ben. Very much appreciate it. All right, take care.